Johnny's own an engine. Hi, Terrell! Oh, hey, Terrell. Me and Grandma were wondering if uh, maybe you could job jet a little Johnny for a few hours every day or so. That way, you know, get a little peace of quiet around the house. What do you say, Terrell? I don't think I can help you with that, Gary. I'm kind of busy right now with this engine and I don't really have time to babysit little Johnny. Sorry about that, little Johnny. That's all right, Terrell, I understand. Yeah, yeah, that's all right, Terrell. Come on, little Johnny, let's get out of here. Come on. Looking for this. Oh. Little Johnny, you scared me. What are you doing back here? Where's, where's the grandpa at? Oh. oh, great. It's that pet Skippy. Wonder what he wants. Don't worry, Cheryl. I'll take care of them. You? You little whippersnapper, oh, you scared me. What can I do for you, old man? Oh, eh, watch it with that old man stuff. Eh? Uh, uh, where's Terrell at? <laughs> Terrell said that you're a pest. And my grandpa, he said pests need to get exterminated. Can I help you with something? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I need a spark plug, eh? How about a CJ8Y? Spark plugs are on their top shelf over there. You're gonna have to climb those boxes to reach them. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't think I was gonna be climbing boxes, eh? But here we go. Oh, it's a little dangerous, eh? CJ oh. 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 oh, thanks, little whippersnapper. Here, here's two dollars. Keep the change. Spark plugs are four dollars, old man. Oh, oh. Okay, uh, uh, here you go. Yeah. Have a good day, young whippersnapper. Yeah. Oh. 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 Little Johnny, what just happened? Skippy the Fast didn't look both ways before crossing the street. Another fast exterminated. I'm hungry! You got any dino rights? Pterodactyl here, and today our video is on this. What the heck is this? Look at this thing. You know what it looks like? It looks like a drill ship from that video game Vulcanoid. Or maybe even Megalon from the Godzilla movie. Remember Megalon? He had like grill hands. But look at this thing, what is it? And I know some of you are saying, I know what that is, Terrell. It's a log splitter. That's right, this is a log splitter. And a lot of you are watching this video go, that's a log splitter? How does that thing split a log? It, it'll split logs, but first thing we need to do is get it running, and then we'll split some logs with it. So it's got a five horse Briggs and Scranton engine on it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pull it over and see if we got any compression. And it feels like it's got compression. And then we should check the oil, see if it's got any dinosaur syrup in it. And it looks like it does, and it looks like it's pretty clean. Yeah, it's full. It's got 
syrup in it, dinosaur syrup. Now we need to see if we got any sparks, any ignition, because we need compression, ignition, and fuel. So we'll see if that thing will spark. We got it on fast. Oh, no sparks. Not a lick. So I looked at the code date on this engine for 1978. So that means this engine has points and condensers. Now let's take this air cleaner off and look at the condition of the carburetor and the fuel tank. You could tell this thing had been outside. Look at how rusty that is. Let's look at this air, air cleaner. This thing is, yeah. Pretty bad. We'll put a new one in it. Now I want to look at the tank. Let me get my flashlight. Oh yeah. It's nasty. It's all rusted and look at that. That's rust and old fuel combined. So chances are this tank is, is garbage. A lot of times when I try to clean these, you can clean these tanks with uh, white vinegar. You can soak it in that, but a lot of times if it's rusted real bad, it'll eat the rust away. And then if it's real bad, it'll just rust right through. Once it eats the, the vinegar eats the rust away, it'll just go right through the tank. So in order to get at the ignition, the coil and everything, if you look at the way this thing is built, you know, this plate and everything is all welded on there. The only way I'm going to be able to get this blower shroud off is to pull the engine. So could you imagine taking this to a shop back in the day if you yanked a rope out of it? You got to pull the engine to put a rope in it. So this this pipe here, you're probably wondering, what is that pipe sticking out of there? This pipe is the handle for moving it around because it's got wheels on it. See, there's a little pin here for that hole to go in. And then this, this pipe has another use for when you're splitting the logs, which we'll get to that later once we get it running. So I need to to get this handle off, there's a pin under here. I remember working on these back in the day at my brother Farrell's shop. Some of these would come in. I think they were kind of dangerous because they don't make them anymore. But from what I understand, they work pretty good. But it's kind of low to the ground. So. I mean, you're basically working on the ground. I guess you could you could mount that on a bench or something and split wood up on some kind of bench or rig you could make for it. So we need to pull this guard off, which is going to have to be repaired. We'll use some of the HB350 on it. I think I'll use some fiberglass resin and some mat to kind of fix this here. Because you should operate this thing with the guard on. It's kind of dangerous again, but hey, that's danger was back in the day. So I guess if this thing would get jammed, if you were trying to uh, split something that it couldn't, or a lot of gear heads around here. If you couldn't, uh, it would, if it stalled or it got stuck on a log, what you do is stop the engine and then they tell you to take a 5-8 socket and shove it in there, and then that would back it up. Oh, Phillips screwdriver. Well, let me get my worn out Phillips screwdriver, my favorite screwdriver, because it's all worn out. Get it, boy, get it. Get it! And let's take this cover off. There's only two screws holding it on. There's two on the bottom that are missing. See, look at the name of it, Bark Buster. This is the Bark Buster. 
<laughs> the bark buster. So it's broke here. Put some HV350 on that. And it's broke here. I'll HV350 that, which we sell in our online store. It's like liquid plastic. Look at this is cracked here. I'll fix that. Then I'll mix me up some fiberglass resin. I'll get some a piece of resin mat. And we'll we'll fix this corner. But we'll do all that once we get it running. Or after we get it running. So look at it. Here's the layout. This is how this thing works. It's got a centrifugal clutch on here, like a mini bike. Get it, boy! And we got number 35 chain here. And it looks like this sprocket's the same diameter as that, so it's kind of a one-to-one -one deal. And then we go to a bigger chain. So and this is the this is the sprocket that goes to the to the screw. So there's got to be a master link. There it is. Let's pop that master link off of there. Let's take this off. Get this chain off. All right. This is going to be a lot of work just to get that. So now I need a socket to take that off, which looks like it's five eighths. Five eighths. And there's a set screw in there. Oh, it was already loose. Now we need to pull that off. Oh, look at there. Looks like somebody already used the old, the old trick that I use with the air hammer. I wonder if this thing came into my brother's barrel shop. I wonder if I worked on this when I was a teenager. Somebody else brought one of these in the shop probably about seven or eight years ago. And I worked on it, got it running. I think it was a different name on it. Whew. That came right off. That came right off the bark buster. All right, now there's a master, master stink, I mean master link on here. All right, we got the chain off. Now let's take this clutch off. Look at how they had this thing shimmed. They had some washers in there. Kind of take up that space in there. Oh, look at that, comes right off. Kinda. I guess we gotta pull this one now, this sprocket. Not mechanic friendly. All right, I'm gonna have to get a, looks like there's some string or something wrapped around here too. All right, I have to get me an Al Elvin wrench to go in there. All right, I got the Elvin screwed loose, and this just slid right off. Got a key in there. And then look at this sprocket. Oh, there's a set screw back there too. Must be hard to get at. Because this thing was kind of loose on there. So that had been taken off. Now we can pull this clutch off, this centrifugal clutch. Let's inspect this real quick. Looks like it's still good. Got a little spacer, washer in there. No set screws on this. Oh, looks like a bolt fell out of here. 
Oh, looks like somebody tried repairing this cover with a piece of sheet metal. Same with this. Looks like they tried repairing that. Maybe it was me back in the day. Maybe I did that repair when I was a teenager at Feral Shop. What do I do here, Feral? And then he would hiss. And then that's, when he's hissing, that means he's stinking. Because he's feral like a cat. And then he would say, put some sheet metal on there. Make some sheet metal patches. And then he'd hiss. We'll patch this up too. Looks like that sprocket was kind of wearing into that. We can put some HV, HV350 all in here. This looks like a pretty decent repair that they did. Here's their little duct tape didn't work. HV350 will fix that up. And then, uh, We'll probably have to re... Let me stick this back in here so I don't lose it. And this muffkin, you know, I don't think it pointed out like this because it started melting the cover. I think it needs to go straight out, so. And it looks like we got a little spacer on here and a washer. That's not the right order that that should go. Usually these spacers, I got a little taper on them that go against the shoulder of that shaft. Well, this one doesn't have it. That's all right. Wow. There's quite a bit to get this. A recoil repair on this back in the day was probably still expensive. Look at all the leaves and stuff. Oh, and this thing pivots so you can adjust the chain. And I wonder if the motor is slotted. So look what I got to do next to get this motor off of here. I got to take this dipstick tube out. And I'm going to remove these four bolts from underneath. Not mechanic friendly. There's a bunch of oil up in there. I, I sucked a lot of it out with our little oil slurper over there. All right, now I can get it out of the frame. Pull these bolts out of here. Leaves all in there. Shell has been sitting outside. I'll get this all cleaned up. Got a model number on it and said where it was made, I think. Phoenix, Arizona. What are they splitting out there? Pine? Pine trees? Oh, you can take it on the bench. Now I gotta clean, that's another 20 minutes cleaning the bench off. Cause I got all kind of projects going at one time. All right, I'm gonna remove this blower shroud. And since this has got points in it, we've got a video that shows you how to upgrade to electronic ignition, which is just as simple as taking the coil off and putting another coil on. So here's that date code. 
So you can see 1978. For those of you that don't know, the first two digits of the code on a Briggs engine is the year it was made. So this one was made in 78. So get a 516th and I'll zip this coil off. Here's the coil. See this wire here that's going behind the flywheel? That's going to the points. See this other wire? This is the kill wire. That also goes to the points. So, we're gonna cut those wires because we don't need them. Unless I wanna put points in it, but I don't wanna do that. We also have a video on how to replace points condenser. The only thing I need is this plug boot. This, right in the garbage, whether it's good or not, don't care. Now I'm going to cut this kill wire back here. I'm going to try to cut it as close as I can to where it goes behind there. And hopefully it's going to be long enough to reach the new coil, which I don't think it will be. So I'll have to make a new wire. All right, so here's the coil. This is an aftermarket coil. This is all your points now are in here. This is your electronic ignition part. So for those of you that don't know, on these coils, it says this side out. So that faces you, this side out. So we'll put this back on. And then here's our tab for our kill wire. So how it kills it is, would be basically, if you took a wire and went from here to ground, that would kill it. So if this engine was running right now and I just touched this from here to here, it would kill the motor. And then when you release it, it'll spark again. Because a lot of people are, you test them coils, you need to put an ohm meter on there and test that coil, you know, that's the, get them ohms readings, you know what? This is an electronic ignition coil. This is how I test them. You pull that ground wire off, and if it sparks, then you know that this wire, this is going to ground and you got a bad stop switch. If you pull this off and it still has no spark, this coil's bad. It's as simple as that. Sit there getting ohm meters and everything and reading the values of it, testing it that way. A bunch of waste of time. We want to make sure these are good and clean because that coil has to ground to the engine. So if this was all rusty, you would have to clean that. Some sandpaper, a Scotch-Brite. So this side out, stick our coil on there. Put our screws back in. Now we're going to pull up on the coil because we're going to have to set an air gap. This thing looks like this got bent. That should be more like that. I said I think somebody had this apart. And of course our ground wire now isn't going to reach. So I'm going to have to make a ground wire. Now, I took my test for the brake service school and they said it doesn't make any difference if these are rusty. They said that has no effect on the spark, but you know what? It does have an effect on the air gap and, it, and what would it hurt to clean them, right? This is the only magnet right here. This is the flywheel. But the legs do land on here. So I like to have it clean. So that's up for discussion. I think rust creates resistance, whether it's a magnet or not. 
So I think if it's cleaner, it probably would make a difference. That's just me. They, they say different. All right. So this end of the wire just clips into there. And of course, every time I tip this thing, oil is coming out. Look at that oil. Look at it, it's nasty. It's got water in it from this thing sitting outside. I hope this thing doesn't smoke when I get done making it run. I should shove something in there. I'll get a plastic cap and stick it in there. Oh, look at this screw fell off from somewhere. All right. And now let's check this starter clutch. Make sure this thing spins free. Skeeter. If you've ever had one of these Briggs engines and it starts squealing real loud and it starts kicking the rope out and squealing so loud you can't stand the noise, usually what happens is when it's kicking that rope out like that and you shut it off, when it comes to rest, it cuts that rope and it usually busts it. That's because this starter clutch, that shaft that this is on, is all dirty and all sticky. And what it's doing, it's, it's keeping this from spinning free. It's, it's getting sticky. Now if you notice, there's a little hole on the end. And at the end of this thing is a little wick. And you could spray some lubricant in there. I remember back in the day, we used to drill a hole in here that was the same size as one of these straws. And then when you put it in there, you can lubricate. So since we got that apart, let's spray a little light lubricant on there. As I search all over for the lubricant. I'm going to spray a little light lube in there. Let that soak in. And I got my 10,000 feeler and I got the magnets over the coil. And when I loosen these up, it sucks it tight against those magnets and that 10,000 feeler. 10 to 12. Business card will work if you don't have vis uh, feeler gauges. We'll make sure it's not rubbing. One guy said a matchbook cover. Where are you going to find matches nowadays? Not like they give them away like they used to. But yeah, a matchbook cover will work if you can find one. All right, bring a little lube on the plug boot. Oh, sorry, Mr. Cameraman. And that'll help get that on there. And we'll throw this cover back on real quick, just for a second, because we're gonna have to take that carburetor off. I'll make sure we get that wire in there. And we're gonna test to see if we got spark. And to make it easier to pull and not jump all over the place, we'll take the spark plug out. And then I'll use my old school Briggs spark tester. Well, make sure we got a good ground. Now let's see if it'll spark. Woo! Woo! We got hot sparkage now. Take a look at the plug, which will give us an indication on how it was running. And it's not really too carboned up or suited up. that back in. So now we got fire. 
Now, take this back off because this will make it a little easier to get at these carburetor screws. Now we got to pull this carburetor off. And it looks like somebody put a stud on this one instead of a screw, which is okay. Take that off. Now we got to get down in here to this one. It's kind of hard to get at. Let's try my uh, my little tool kit I got here from that Carol fan. See if we can get in there with this and get that screw out. It looks like it might be a little tight. Yeah, that's going to be a little difficult. Here's a wrench that I made years ago where I ground it down real thin so you can get in here and get at some of these. I know the cameraman's trying to get in there. It's difficult for, for us to show you, but there's a screw in there. Got a 3 8 head on it. So when you can't get a wrench in there and offset screwdriver, usually I just take a screwdriver and do this. Get it in from the side. Man, they really got that thing tight. And try to get it off that way by getting in those flats. I got the fuel tank carburetor off. Let's see what that fuel looks like. It smells nasty. Oh, look at that. Isn't that delicious? That is just delicious. Oh, you can hear all the crap down in the bottom of the tank, too. Oh, look at that. I don't know what that is. Rust. This thing is ruined. Yeah, I know you're curious, so I'm gonna take this apart so you can look inside. I got an engine that we got from Mighty Mike. He's a local guy, small engine guy and a Terrell fan. So he gave me an engine not too long ago. And it's got a good carburetor. It's from the same year. It's got this uh, adjustable carburetor which, you know, later years with the EPA regulations, they took all these adjustments off. So he gave me a, a good tank and carburetor. Yeah, look at this. Look at that. Oh, look at that just broke right off. Yep. Look at that. Ugh. Excuse me. Yeah, this thing's... <clears throat> Oop, excuse me. This thing's trash. There's no saving that. You know what we call this? Scrap metal. Garbage. I want that, Terrell. I want that tank. I need that tank and carburetor. Yeah. Well, come dig it out of my trash. So I took this carburetor apart off of this other donor tank because it's nice and clean. And I wanted to inspect it before I just assumed that it was a good carburetor and tank set up. Well, good thing I inspected it. Because this is a common problem. And again, we have a video on this carburetor. So I wanted to check this tube. And there's a split all the way down this tube. Which means it's not going to pump up any fuel. Because that split is going to cause it to suck air. You cannot buy this too. And I just recently ran out of these and went to reorder more, and this is no longer available. So again, if you want to fix one of these old engines, and it's like, I can't fix it now, they don't have that tube and all that. I have to buy some kind of aftermarket one. 
three sixteenths brake tubing. I got brake tubing. I buy it on a on a spool. You can buy it in a length at the auto parts store. You don't have to buy 25 feet. You could go to the auto parts store and tell tell them I need a, a short piece of 3 16 brake tubing. I think they might have it in like a foot long. So I'm gonna take Mr. Heat Gun and I'm gonna try to warm this up and pull that off so I could reuse it and put it on there. Now, I know you're saying, you just said that that part's no longer available. How am I gonna fix it? So what you would do is just take a piece of brake tubing and just make it this length, the whole length. Just eliminate this, even though it's got a screen on the bottom. Just eliminate this and just make the tube this long. But you gotta be careful to make sure the tube doesn't hit the bottom of the tank. It's gotta sit off the bottom of the tank. So you're gonna have to shove something down in there to gauge it. So you know how deep the tank is. Piece of wire, a zip tie, and then that way you can make your piece of tubing a little bit shorter so it doesn't hit the bottom of the tank. Because if it hits the bottom of the tank, it ain't gonna suck any fuel up either. Because now you just blocked it off. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to reuse this. If not, I'll just take my piece of brake tubing here and I'll just cut a long one. Oh, and then I put a new diaphragm in it. This one, this one's not bad. It's still a little pliable, but I just went ahead and put a new one in. And also, I need some of these parts off this old carburetor. So I could use this control again. So I could start it, stop it, choke it. So I'm gonna pull this link off of here and this part, and I'm gonna transfer it all to here. So I can use that. Then I'll throw this in the scrap. Then you can come to the shop and dig through my garbage. Oh, and the stop switch. Uh, uh, excuse me. I needed the stop switch, which goes in, in here somewhere. Right there. There. I had to steal that off the old tank. So when we go to kill it, It'll stop. Let's just hope that this tank that Mighty gave me don't leak. Got the carburetor all back together. Got those linkages put on. Did my old heat quench trick to get the muffkin off. So we can put the muffkin in the way it was original. Straight out the back so it don't melt on that cover. Now I'll go ahead and put the carburetor on, put the blower shroud back on, put the muffkin on, we'll put the engine back on and uh, fire it up, fire it up, fire it up, fire it up. Shut up! Where is he? Oh, he's in my head. That's not a good place to be. All right, so I decided to go back with the way they had it because when I shoved the muffkin straight in, it was like really close to all this gas tank and everything. So I decided to just turn it up away from that guard that's here. So it's shooting straight up. But this is all working. We're getting full choke. It's releasing the choke and it's going to stop. And then this should fit on there when we get done. So now I'm just gonna bolt it back in the frame, put the dipstick tube back in, fill it up with some dinosaur syrup and some dinosaur juice. We'll see if it starts and runs. We'll tune the carburetor a little bit, and if it does, put all those sprockets and chains and everything back in. All right, I got the engine bolts in. I just wanted to show you that this engine is it's slotted on this frame. So that's how you adjust the one chain in case it gets loose. And then this carrier here for that other sprocket, this pivots too. And if you notice, there's a little jack screw right here and that helps you to pivot it to put tension on that other chain. 
So both these chains on this here log splitter are adjustable and that's how that works. Just in case you were wondering, because I know some of you are probably wondering. Well, how did they adjust those chains if those chains get loose? So this is slotted to adjust that and then this is slotted to this little carrier and these bearings they seem like they're a little little rough but I'm sure it'll be okay for what we're going to do for it we just want to make sure it works this is all stuff that could be done at a later date we just want to get it going right now see if it works then it can all be taken back apart all right, I got it mounted. I got the dinosaur syrup in it. I got dinosaur juice. Now I'm not gonna sit there and pull on this thing 30 times to pump up the fuel, so I'm gonna give it a little help. Killed it, stop switch work. I think 3400 is good, especially for this little log splitter. So, what I was bending on was this back here. See how that fits in there? So, usually, this on these carburetors, this is like this. And the governor spring is going from here to that arm, which goes into the engine block. So what I'm doing is I'm reaching in there and I'm bending on this 
which is putting more tension on that governor spring, which is going to raise the high-speed RPM. Now, you've seen that thing was dancing all over the place when I increased the speed. When it was running at almost 3,000 RPM, you know, it wasn't dancing all over the floor. Then when I boosted it up, it started to spin around. Well, uh, you know, they usually say on the, on the sticker that it should run at 3,600, but I think 34 where I got it is probably more than enough speed to spin that thing to get it to, to split wood. And then if I have to increase it, I can always go back in there and, and boost it up another 200 RPM with this. Now I know what you're saying. Terrell, Terrell, I want that tool. I want that tool. What's the number of that tool? So we'll get you the number of the tool and we'll put it down here in case you want to get one of these. All right, I got this cover back on. I did put some of my HB350 on there. I'm gonna let that dry. Uh, we're crunch time here. It's, 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 it's around midnight. Uh, if you notice, it's kind of quiet out there now. You don't hear all them Ricky Bobbies out there. They all went to bed. All the Ricky Bobbies went to bed. This set screw on this sprocket was frozen, so I had to do my heat quench trick. I'm going to put a bolt in there this time. So I'm going to put this on, I got the clutch on, put the key in there, and then that way I can get to that bolt and tighten that bolt down because that thing was loose. So where's the key? Is this the key for this one? And we'll finish putting this thing together. Alright, I got it all back together. I need to glue that other cover and fix it, but I'll do that at a later date. Let me tighten this down. Did I forget anything else? No. Alright. I'm sure this thing spins real slow. I'm sure it doesn't spin real fast. some wood to split. I need to get the heck out of here. It's like 2 in the morning now. Oh, it's been a long day and I just got to go home and sleep for a couple hours and get up and do it all over again. Well, I got this cover all secured and repaired so now it's all safe again. Now all we need to do is go out and split some logs. But the problem is there's no logs here. The only logs we got are floating in the toilet. No, there's some logs outside. So this pipe here, it acts like a handle so you can roll it around. And then I'm going to disconnect, take this pin out back here.
Then you take this and you stick it in here. And I'm gonna lift it up a little bit. Come on, there. You see how that fits into there? And you stick the pin back in so it doesn't come out. And then the other end has got this foot on it and there's a hole in there too. I think what you could have done is if you wanted to make some kind of little uh, table or something you could put this on to get it up a little higher because you're going to be doing a lot of this standing down here. So now I'm going to show you how this thing works. I'm going to fire it up. thing is called the bark buster it works it's a log splitter I mean it's a little slower than maybe a hydraulic uh, operated one but it does work all you do is stab it on there and it just screws into it and splits it everything's right here see it shows you small logs large logs and they want want them to be cut between you know a certain certain length so it catches this bar, which keeps it from flipping around. That's what the bar is for. So yeah, nifty little uh, log splitter. I'm sure if you found one of these somewhere, you could pick it up cheap. You know, log splitters, what, a cheap log splitter is probably over a thousand dollars, I would assume. So there it is, the Bark Buster. Little log splitter. So subscribe to this YouTube channel, Tarot Fixes All. Follow me with your Bark Busters. I'm sure they made it under a bunch of other names too. On Facebook and Instagram. 
go to our web store, buy some tarot apparel, I'm wearing the knuckleheads operating power equipment shirt. And as always, there's your dinner. Woo! Bark Busters! Working again! Busting bark! You know, they did make an attachment that you could put on your car like this. You jack your car up, take the wheel off, and you mount something like this to where the wheels go, and you put the car in gear, and that thing would spin, and, and you would split wood that way. Isn't that crazy? Crazy technology. But it works. Johnny, I'm gonna have to call your grandpa and let him know you're here. He's probably worried sick about you. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Oh, Johnny, you're being ridiculous. Oh, great, there's something wrong with the phone. Johnny, Johnny, where'd you go? What's that, what's that burning smell? Oh, great! Oh, Johnny, get away from that mower! I told you! Bad things were gonna happen! Too much of a pain in your butt, Terrell. Can we get ice cream, Grandpa? No, 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 I don't think so, Johnny. There's no time. We gotta get home. Grandma's waiting. Well, I think we need to get ice cream. Or else bad things are gonna happen. Alright, alright, Johnny. Alright. Just don't hurt us. Get your little chocolate swirl in your belly. Alright, Terrell. We'll see you later. Thanks for looking after him. Come on, Johnny. That's the last time I work on an owning engine again. <laughs> <laughs>